that in searching for the causes of the great upheavals of the past, and in considering their effects, I became skeptical of the great theories concerning celestial motions that were formulated when the historical facts described here were not all known to science. The subject deserves to be discussed in detail and quantitatively. All that I would venture to say at this time, and in this place, is the following. The accepted celestial mechanics notwithstanding the many calculations that have been carried out to many decimal places or verified by celestial motions stands only if the sun, the source of light and warmth and other radiation produced by fusion and fission of atoms, is as a whole an electrical neutral body and also if the planets and their usual orbits are neutral bodies, fundamental principles in celestial mechanics, including the law of gravitation, must come into question if the sun possesses a charge sufficient to influence the planets in their gravitation, in their orbits or comets in theirs. In the Newtonian celestial mechanics, based on the theory of gravitation, electricity and magnetism play no role. Emanuel Velikovsky, New York, 1950 Preface 1965 First published in 1950, this book was left unchanged in all subsequent printing, nor have any textual changes been made in this paper-bound edition. This was so by design that I wish to keep the text in its original form in order that, unaltered, it should face all subsequent discovery in the fields it covers or touches upon. Should there have been changes, the reader of a new edition would be unable to judge to what extent a book heretical in 1950 could measure up to later developments. In 1950, it was generally assumed that the fundamentals of science were all known and that only details and decimals were left to fill in. In that same year, a cosmologist, certainly not of a conservative bent of mind, Fred Hoyle, wrote in the conclusion of his book, The Nature of the Universe. It is likely that any astonishing new developments are lying in wait for us. It is possible that cosmology of 500 years hence will extend as far beyond our present beliefs as our cosmology goes beyond that of Newton. And he continued, I doubt whether this will be so. I am prepared to believe that there will be many advances in the detailed understanding of matters that still baffle us. But by and large, I think that our present picture will turn out to bear an approximate resemblance to the cosmologies of the future. And he referred to the limitations of optical means in penetrating the depth of space. The years that have passed since the publication of Worlds in Collision have seen the first great achievements in radio astronomy, the discoveries of the International Geophysical Year, and the dawn of the Space Age. The picture has changed completely. <laughs> Signs of recent violence, disruption, Fragmentation have been observed on Earth and elsewhere in the solar system. A submarine gigantic canyon that runs almost twice around the globe. A sign of global twist. A layer of vash of extraterrestrial origin underlying all oceans. Paleomagnetic evidence that the magnetic poles were suddenly repeatedly reversed and it is claimed the terrestrial axis with them. Gases escaping on some craters on the moon thought to be cold to its center and exceedingly high surface heat on Venus. Furthermore, with the discovery of radio signals arriving from Jupiter of the existence of a magnetosphere surrounding the Earth of the solar plasma of the net charge on the Sun and the magnetic field permeating the interdisciplinary field of space, decisive evidence has come up that the solar system and the universe in general are not electromagnetically sterile. A basic change in, in the understanding of the universe, its nature, and the forces active in it. The words found in the preface of the 1950 edition, designating the work as heresy, in realms where the names Newton and Darwin reign supreme, should no longer invoke a spontaneous rejection on the part of even the most conservative in science unless it is a defense mechanism devised to protect an inner realization of incertitude. What to the scientist constitutes a really satisfactory sort of success 
for a theory. The answer lies largely in the words generally elegance, control, and prediction. As to generality, hardly anyone raised an objection. Possibly there was some elegance in the timing when these words were written in 1960, ten years after the publication of my book and the great opposition it provoked. Some of the mostly compelling data were radioed by the space vehicle Pioneer 5. I would like to relate here a few details about the control and prediction of two crucial tests. Decisive for this book, early in my work, I came to the understanding that Venus is a newcomer to the planetary family, that it had a stormy, if only short, history, and that it must still be very hot and giving off heat. Further, that it must be surrounded by a very extensive envelope of hydrocarbon, petroleum, gases, and dust. Such claims were in total disagreement with what was known in 1946 when I completed the manuscript of the work, or in 1950 when it was published, to stress the crucial nature of these claims. They were put under the headings, the gases of Venus and the thermal balance of Venus immediately preceding the section the end. Should I be right in these claims, the entire chain of deductions of which identification of the extraterrestrial agent of the paroxysm described is but the final ring, is strengthened. And since these crucial claims were in flagrant discord with the accepted values, in case of confirmation they ought not to be denoted as lucky guesses. As late as 1959, Venus, ground temperature, was calculated to be only 17 degrees Celsius, three degrees above the mean annual temperature of the Earth. But by 1961, from the nature of the radio signals emitted by Venus, it was found that Venus, ground temperature, is about 315 degrees Celsius, or 600 degrees Fahrenheit. Dr. F. D. Drake of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, responsible for this reading, wrote, We would have expected a temperature only slightly greater than that of the Earth, and the find was a surprise in a field in which the fewest surprises were expected. There was, admittingly, no satisfactory explanation of such high temperature of Venus in the frame of the accepted notions. Greenhouse effect could not explain so high a temperature, nor could radioactivity decaying for billions of years. The Mariner 2, the space vehicle that passed Venus in December 1962, was instrumented to detect whether the heat is real and as high as 600 degrees. It found it real and a full 800 degrees. It found also that the night side of Venus, if anything, hotter than the day side, and that light does not penetrate the cloud cover. It must be gloomy and bleak under this cover. It is stated in the Mariner Project by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, very little greenhouse effect could realize itself under such conditions. The other crucial test concerned the gaseous envelope of the planet. In 1946, four years before publication of this book, I directed a request and inquiry to Professor R. Wilt of Yale and the late Professor W. S. Adams of Mount Wilson and Palomar Observatories. Foremost authorities on the subject of planetary atmosphere. You know, I'm thinking, I'm wondering if Halt and Arp knew about Velikovsky and what his thoughts were on him. That would be interesting, because Halt and Arp was at Palomar, right? Further, most authorities on the subject of planetary atmosphere indicating that the presence of hydrocarbon gases and dust in the cloud envelope of Venus would constitute a crucial test for the cosmological concepts evolved from the study of historical sources. Wilt wrote on September 13, 1946, the absorption spectrum of Venus atmosphere cannot be interpreted as resulting from gaseous hydrocarbons. Adams answered September 9, 1946, there is no evidence of the presence of hydrocarbon gas in the atmosphere of Venus. I must have been completely firm in my belief of not having made a wrong deduction. From the first premise of global catastrophe to the last one, 
of identifying the agent to have chosen to print in disregard of the expert opinions on the basis of this research. I assume that Venus must be rich in petroleum gases. On February 26, 1963, Making known the results of the Mariner probe, Dr. Homer Newell of NASA announced that in the judgment of those responsible for that part of the program, Venus is enshrouded in an envelope of hydrocarbon gases and dust, 15 miles thick, 45 miles above the ground of the planet. It was acknowledged as very puzzling that Venus should have such a massive atmosphere, a score of times heavier than the terrestrial atmosphere, that it should have taken the form of an envelope 45 miles above the surface of the planet, and that it should consist of heavy molecules of hydrocarbon gases and dust. It was also found that Venus rotates retrogradely, though very slowly, a sign of its having been disturbed in its motion in the past, or having been captured by the sun, or having originated in a way different from the other planets. At the time of the Mariner probe, two prominent members of the American scientific community, V. Bargman, professor of physics, Princeton University, and Lloyd Motz, professor of astronomy, Columbia University, wrote a letter to science, December 21st, 1962, claiming for me the correct prediction of the great heat of Venus, of the radio noises from Jupiter, of the existence of a magnetosphere around the Earth. A paper, some additional examples of correct prognosis, written by me, was printed in the September 1963 issue of the American Behavioral Scientist. It contains a survey of various tests, confirmations, and supporting evidence. And that issue, sponsored by a group of eminent men in scholarship and public affairs, has also told the story of reception or rejection of this book, coupled with efforts toward its suppression. It was actually successfully suppressed while in the hands of the first publisher, who had to give it up, though a number one bestseller, under the exerted boycott of all this publisher's textbooks by certain groups organized for that purpose in some of the academic councils of the country. Some attempts were made to minimize the value of the crucial test claim and confirmations obtained. A prominent astronomer wrote in December 1963 issue of Harper's, As to the high temperature of Venus, hot is only a relative term. For example, liquid air is hot relative to liquid helium, whereas I claimed an incandescent state of Venus and a gaseous state of all hydrocarbons. Professor H. H. Hess, huh. chairman of the Space Board of the National Academy of Sciences, volunteered to write me a letter for publication. Some of these predictions were said to be impossible when you made them. All of them were predicted long before proof that they were correct came to hand. Conversely, I do not know of any specific prediction you made that was since proven to be false. If my premises are wrong, and only by sheer chance did I obtain such a score, then the theorists of probabilities ought to find out the odds involved. If, as some friendlier skeptics assume, the score is due to an unusual gift of intuition, then I should be accused of sorcery not only of heresy. However, if the story is a reconstruction of the events that took place and of logical implications of them, then the score is but a natural fallout from a single central idea, R. Jurgens. Nevertheless, more efforts were made to disqualify this work, but hardly any astronomical argument of 1950 could be brought profitably against my book in 1964 without denying all the important discoveries of the intervening years. Therefore, attempts were made to evade all these issues and to switch the debate, actually a campaign of depreciation, to questioning my proper use of sources. When a journal printed for physicists serves its readers with philological arguments in Egyptology and commits the task to a journalist uninformed and rash, in the mild appraisal of Professor Moses Masias and prints a vulgar display of ignorance and distortion, then it is as good as an admission that none of the physical arguments employed earlier could carry weight.
and no new ones could be devised. It is about such tactics that the student paper, the Daily Princetonian, wrote editorially February 1964. While it could have been assumed that anyone challenging the basic premises of Newton and Darwin might be laying himself open to a certain amount of argument, the personal vituperation deliberate misrepresentation of facts, offhand misquotations, efforts at suppression of the books containing the theories and the denial of the right to rebut opponents in professional journals that Dr. Velikovsky encountered indicate that far more was going on than mere challenge to established ideas. What the Velikovsky affair made crystal clear is that the theories of science may be held not only for the truth they embody, but because of the vested interests they represent for those who hold them. The deplorable tactics of certain groups in the academia are not alienated the younger generation, and the historical and physical evidence accumulating with each passing year did not escape their sight, and conclusions were drawn. What was unbelievable and heretical in 1950 is making great inroads into the science that claimed dogmatic completeness and infallibility as recently as then. On the eve of the publication of Worlds in Collision, the Professor H. Butterfield wrote The Origin of Modern Science, 1949. But the supreme paradox of the scientific revolution is in the fact that things which we find it easy to instill into the boys at school, things which would strike us as the ordinary natural way of looking at the universe, defeated the greatest intellects for centuries. The author, 1965. Indeed. Preface 1950 Worlds in Collision is a book of wars in the celestial sphere that took place in historical time. In these wars, the planet Earth participated too. This book describes two acts of a great drama, one that occurred 34 to 35 centuries ago, in the middle of the second millennium before the present era the other in the 8th and beginning of the 7th century, before the present era. 26 centuries ago, accordingly, this volume consists of two parts, preceded by a prologue. Harmony, or stability, in the celestial and terrestrial spheres, is the point of departure of the present-day concept of the world as expressed in the celestial mechanics of Newton and the theory of evolution of Darwin. If these two men of science are sacrosanct, this book is a heresy. However, modern physics of atoms and of the quantum theory describes dramatic changes in the microcosm, the atom, the prototype of the solar system, a theory then that envisages not dissimilar events in the macrocosm. The solar system brings the modern concepts of physics to the celestial sphere. This book is written for the instructed and uninstructed alike. No formula, no hieroglyphic, will stand in the way of those who set out to read it. If occasionally historical evidence does not square with formulated laws, it should be remembered that a law is but a deduction from experience, an experiment, and therefore laws must conform with historical facts, not the facts with laws. The reader is not asked to accept a theory without question. Rather, he is invited to consider for himself whether he is reading a book of fiction or nonfiction. Whether he is reading is invention or historical fact. On one point alone, not necessarily decisive for the theory of cosmic catastrophism, I borrow credence. I use a synchronical scale of Egyptian and Hebrew histories, which is not orthodox. It was in the spring of 1940 that I came upon the idea that in the days of the Exodus, as evident from many passages of the scriptures, there occurred a great physical catastrophe, and that such an event could serve in determining the time of the exodus in Egyptian history 
or in establishing a synchronical scale for the histories of the peoples concerned. Thus, I started Ages in Chaos, a reconstruction of the history of the ancient world from the middle of the second millennium before the present era to the advent of Alexander the Great. Already in the fall of that same year, 1940, I felt that I had acquired an understanding of the real nature and extent of the catastrophe. And for nine years, I worked on both projects, the political and natural histories. Although Ages and Chaos was finished first in the order of publication, it will follow this work. Worlds in Collision comprises only the last two acts of the cosmic drama. A few earlier acts, one of them known as the Deluge, will be the subject of another volume of natural history. The historical cosmological story of this book is based on the evidence of historical texts of many peoples around the globe, on classical literature, on epics of northern races, on sacred books of the peoples of the Orient, and Occident, on traditions and folklore of primitive peoples, on old astronomical inscriptions and charts, on archaeological finds, and also on geological and paleontological material. If cosmic upheavals occurred in the historical past, why does not the human race remember them? And why was it necessary to carry on research to find out about them? I discuss this problem in the section Collective Amnesia. The task I had to accomplish was not unlike that faced by a psychoanalyst who, out of disassociated memories and dreams, reconstructs a forgotten traumatic experience in the early life of an individual in an analytical experiment on mankind. Historical inscriptions and legendary motifs often play the same role as recollection, infantile memory and dreams in the analysis of a personality. Can we, out of this polymorphous material, establish actual facts? We shall check one people against another, one inscription against another, epics against charts, geology against legends, until we are able to extract the historical facts. In a few cases, it is impossible to say with certainty whether a record or tradition refers to one or another catastrophe that took place through the ages. It is also probable that, in some traditions, various elements from different ages are fused together. In the final analysis, however, it is not so essential to segregate definitively the records of single world catastrophes. More important, it seems, is to establish, one, that there were physical upheavals of a global character in historical times. Two, that these catastrophes were caused by extraterrestrial agents, and three, that these agents can be identified. There are many implications that follow from these conclusions. I refer to them in the epilogue so that I can omit reference to them here. A few readers went over this book in manuscript and made valuable suggestions and remarks in chronological order. Of their reading, they are Dr. Horace M. Callan, formerly Dean of Graduate Faculty of the New School for Social Research, New York, John J. O'Neill, Science Editor of the New York Herald Tribune, James Putnam, Associate Editor of the Macmillan Company, Clifton Fadman, Literary Critic and Commenter, Gordon A. Atwater, Chairman and Curator of the Hayden Planetarium and the American Museum of Natural History in New York. The last two read the work at their own request after Mr. O'Neill had discussed it in an article in the Herald Tribune of August 11th, 1946. I am indebted to all of them, but I alone am responsible for the content and form. Miss Marion Kuhn cleared the manuscript of grammatical weeds and helped in reading the proofs. Many an author has dedicated his book to his wife or mentioned her in the preface. I've always felt this was somewhat ostentatious, but now that this work is being published, I feel I shall be most ungrateful if I fail to mention that my wife, Ella Shiva, spent almost as much time on it at our desk as I did. I dedicate this book to her. The years when ages and chaos and worlds and collision were written were years of a world catastrophe created by man. The years when ages and chaos and worlds in collision were written were years of a world catastrophe created by man of war that was fought on land, on sea, and in the air. 
During the time, man learned how to take apart a few of the bricks of which the universe is built, the atoms of uranium. If one day he should solve the problem of fission and fusion of the atoms, of which the crust of the earth or the water or air are composed, he may by chance, by initiating a chain reaction, take this planet out of the struggle for survival among the members of the celestial sphere. New York, September 1949. The author, the author, the author, the author, the author. Chapter 1. In an Immense Universe Quota pars apuris tanti nobis commuter Seneca In an immense universe, a little globe revolves around a star. It is the third star in a row, Mercury, Venus, Earth, of the planetary family. It is of a solid core covered over most of its surface with liquid and has a gaseous envelope. Living creatures fill the liquid. Other living creatures fly in the gas, and still others creep and walk upon the ground on the bottom of the gaseous ocean. Man, a being of erect stature, thinks himself the prince of creation. He felt like this long before he, by his own efforts, came to know how to fly on wings of metal around the globe. He felt godlike before he could talk to his fellow man on the other side of the globe. Today, he can see the microcosm in a drop of water, and the elements in the stars. He knows the laws governing the living cell and its chromosomes, and the laws governing the macrocosm of the sun, moon, planets, and stars. He assumes that gravitation keeps the planetary system together. Man and beast on their planet, the sea within its borders, for millions and millions of years he maintains the planets have rolled along on the same paths and their moons around them and man in these eons has arisen from a one cell infusorium all the long way up the ladder to his status of homo sapien is man's knowledge now nearly complete are only a few more steps necessary to conquer the universe to extract the energy of the atom since these pages were written this has already been done to cure cancer to control genetics to communicate with other planets and learn if they have living creatures too. Here begins Homo Ignoramus. He does not know what life is or how it became to be, whether it originated from inorganic matter. He does not know whether other planets of this sun or of other suns have life on them, whether the forms of life there are like those around us, ourselves included. He does not know how this solar system came into being, although he has built up a few hypotheses around it. He knows only that the solar system was constructed billions of years ago. He does not know what this mysterious force of gravitation is that holds him and his fellow man on the other side of the planet with their feet on the ground. Although he regards the phenomenon itself as the law of laws, he does not know what the earth looks like five miles under his feet. He does not know how mountains came into existence or what caused the emergence of the continents, although he builds hypotheses around these. Nor does he know from where oil came. Again, hypotheses. He does not know why, only a short time ago, a thick glacial sheet pressed upon most of Europe and North America, as he believes it did. Nor how palms could grow above the polar circle. Nor how it came about that the same fauna fill the inner lakes of the old and the new world. He does not know where the salt in the sea came from. Although man knows that he has lived on this planet for millions of years, he finds a recorded history of only a few thousand years, and even these few thousand years are not sufficiently well known. Why did the Bronze Age precede the Iron Age, even though iron is more widely distributed over the world, and its manufacture is simpler than that of the alloy of copper and tin? But what mechanical means were structures of immense blocks built on high mountains of the Andes. Kind of, it is a mystery. Why did brass come before iron if iron is so much easier to make and stronger? What caused the legend of the flood to originate in all countries of the world? Is there any adequate meaning to the term antediluvian? From what experiences grew the 
eschatological pictures of the end of the world? In this work, of which the present book is the first, some of these questions will be answered, but only at the cost of giving up certain notions now regarded as sacred laws in science. The millions of years of the present constitution of the solar system and the harmonious revolution of the Earth, with all their implication as regards to the theory of evolution. The Celestial Harmony The sun rises in the east and sets in the west. The day consists of 24 hours. The year consists of 365 days, 5 hours, and 49 minutes. The moon circles the earth, changing its phases, crescent, full, decrescent. The terrestrial axis points in the direction of the polar star. After winter comes spring, then summer, then fall. These are common facts. Are they invariable laws? Must it be forever? Was it always so? The sun has nine planets. Mercury has no satellites. Venus has no satellites. The earth has the moon. Mars has two small trabants, mere pieces of rock and one of them completes its month before Mars ends its day. Jupiter has 11 moons. This was back in the 1940s when he wrote this, the pre-space age, and 11 different kinds of months to count. Saturn has, I think, oh yeah, Jupiter has 79 moons, Saturn has 82. That's the last current. Uranus has five moons here. That's what, that was what was known by science at the time. I'll just leave it at that. Neptune 1, Pluto 9. The sun rotates in an easterly direction. All planets revolve in their orbits in the same direction, counterclockwise if seen from the north, around the sun. Most of their moons revolve counterclockwise in direct motion, but there are a few that revolve in the opposite direction, in retrograde motion. No orbit is an exact circle. There is no regularity to the eccentrical shapes of the planetary orbits. Each elliptical curve verges in a different direction. It is not known for certain, but it is assumed that Mercury permanently shows the same face to the Sun, as our moon does with respect to the Earth. Information obtained by different methods of observation of Venus is contradictory. It is not known whether Venus rotates so slowly that its day equals its year, or so rapidly that the night side is never sufficiently cool. Mars rotates in 24 hours, 37 minutes, 22.6 second mean period, a period comparable to the terrestrial day. Jupiter, which in volume is 1300 times larger than the Earth, completes a rotation in the short space of 9 hours and 50 minutes. It's spinning. What causes this variability? Is it not a law that planets should rotate or have days and nights? Still, less that its day and night must return every 24 hours. If Pluto rotates from east to west, it has the sun rising in the west. Uranus has the sun rising and setting neither in the east nor the west, so it is not a law that a planet of the solar system must rotate from west to east, and that the sun must rise in the east. The equator of the earth is inclined to the plane of its ecliptic at an angle of 23 and a half degrees. This causes the change of seasons during the annual revolution of the sun. The axis of the other planets point in other directions of seemingly deliberate choice it is not a general law for all planets that winter must follow fall and summer is the spring. The axis of Uranus is placed almost in the plane of its orbit. For about 20 years, one of its polar regions is the hottest place on the planet. Then night gradually descends and 20 years later, the other pole enters the tropics for an equal length of time. The moon has no atmosphere. It is not known whether Mercury has any atmosphere. Venus is covered with dense clouds, but not of water vapor. Mars has a transparent atmosphere, but almost without oxygen or water vapor. Its composition is unknown. Jupiter and Saturn have gaseous envelopes. It is not known whether they have solid cores. It is not a general law that a planet have an atmosphere or water. Mars is 0.15 the volume of the Earth. The next planet, Jupiter, is about 8,750 times as large as Mars. There is no regularity of or relation between the size of the planets and their position in the system. On Mars are seen canals and polar caps. On the moon, craters. The Earth has reflecting oceans. Venus has brilliant clouds. Jupiter has belts and a red spot. 
Saturn has rings. The celestial harmony is composed of bodies different in size, different in form, different in the velocity of rotation, with differently directed axis of rotation, with different directions of rotation, with differently composed atmospheres, or without atmospheres, with a varying number of moons or without moons, and with satellites revolving in either direction. It appears then to be by chance that the Earth has a moon, that we have day and night, and that their combined length is equal to 24 hours, that we have a sequence of seasons, we have oceans and water, atmosphere and oxygen, and probably also that our planet is placed between Venus at our left and Mars at our right. The Origin of the Planetary System All theories of the origin of the planetary system and the motive forces that sustain the motion of its members go back to the gravitational theory and the celestial mechanics of Newton. The Sun attracts the planets, and if it were not for a second urge, they would fall into the Sun. But each planet is impelled by its momentum to proceed in a direction away from the Sun, and as a result, an orbit is formed. Similarly, a satellite or a moon is subject to an urge that drives it away from its primary. But the attraction of the primary bends the path on which the satellite would have proceeded if there had been no primary, if there had been no attraction between the bodies. And out of these urges, the satellite's orbit is traced. The inertia or persistence of motion implanted in planets and satellites was postulated by Newton, but he did not explain how or when the initial pull or push occurred. The theory of the origin of planetary system which dominated the entire 19th century was proposed by Swedenborg, the theologian, and Kant, the philosopher. It was put into scientific terms by Laplace, although not explored by him quantitatively, and in brief is as follows. Hundreds of millions of years ago, the Sun was nebulous and very large, and had a form approaching that of a disk. This disk was as wide as the whole orbit of the furthest of the planets. It rotated around its center, owing to the process of compression caused by gravitation. A globular sun, a globular sun. shaped itself in the center of the disk. Because of the rotating motion of the whole nebula, a centrifugal force was in action parts of matter, more on the periphery, resisted the attracting action directed toward the center and broke up into rings, which balled into globes. These were planets in the process of shaping. In other words, as a result of the shrinkage of the rotating sun, matter broke away and portions of this solar material developed into planets. The plane in which the planets revolve is the equatorial plane of the sun. This theory is now regarded as unsatisfactory. Three objections stand out above others. First, the velocity of the axial rotation of the Sun. At the time the planetary system was built, could not have been sufficient to enable bands of matter to break away. But even if they had broken away, they would not have balled into globes. Second, the Laplace theory does not explain why planets have larger angular velocity of daily rotation and yearly revolution than the Sun could have imparted to them. Third, what made some of the satellites revolve retrogradely, or in a direction opposite to that most of the members of the solar system? It appears to be clearly established that whatever structure we assign to a primitive Sun, a planetary system cannot come into being merely as the result of the Sun's rotation. If a Sun rotating alone in space is not able of itself to produce its family of planets and satellites, it becomes necessary to invoke the presence and assistance of some second body. This brings us at once to the tidal theory. The tidal theory, which in its earlier stage was called the planetesimal theory, assumes that a star passed close to the sun. An immense tide of matter arose from the sun in the direction of the passing star and was torn from the body of the sun but remained in its domain, being the material out of which the planets were built. In the planetesimal theory, the mass 
that was torn out, broke into small parts, which solidified in space. Some were driven out of the solar system, and some fell back into the sun, but the rest moved around it because of its gravitational pull. Sweeping into elongated orbits around the sun, they conglomerated, rounded out their orbits as a result of mutual collisions, and grew to form planets and satellites around the planets. The tidal theory does not allow the matter torn from the sun to disperse first and reunite later. The tide broke into a few portions that rather quickly changed from gaseous fluid and then to the solid state. In support of this theory, it was indicated that such a tide, when broken into a number of drops, would probably build the largest drops out of its middle portion and the small drops from its beginning near the sun and its end most remote from the sun. Actually, Mercury, nearest to the Sun, is a small planet. Venus is larger, Earth a little larger than Venus. Jupiter is 320 times as large as the Earth in mass. Saturn is somewhat smaller than Jupiter. Uranus and Neptune, though large planets, are not as large as Jupiter and Saturn. Pluto is quite small as Mercury. The first difficulty of the tidal hypothesis lies in the very point adduced in its support, the mass of the planets. Between the Earth and Jupiter, there revolves a small planet, Mars, a tenth part of the Earth in mass, where, according to the scheme, a planet ten to fifty times as large as the Earth should be expected. Again, Neptune is larger and not smaller than Uranus. Another difficulty is the allegedly rare chance of an encounter between two stars. One of the authors of the tidal theory gave this estimate of its probability. Uh, you remember the load of dust, the Burnham model? Two specks of dust, four and a half miles apart, the sun and its nearest star. It's amazing when you look at it that way. At a rough estimate, we may suppose that a given star's chance of forming a planetary system is one in five, that would be millions, billions, trillions, quadrillion. See how many sets of zeros? One, two, three, four, five, six sets of zeros. With five quadrillion years, but since the lifespan of a star is much shorter than this figure, only about one star in 100,000 can have formed a planetary system in the whole of its life. But we know that's not true now. In the galactic system of 100 million stars, planetary systems form at a rate of about one per five billion. Our own system, with the age of the order of two billion years, is probably the youngest system in the whole galactic system of stars. The nebular and tidal theories alike regard the planets as derivatives of the sun and the satellites as derivatives of the planets. The problem of the origin of the moon can be regarded as disturbing to the tidal theory. Being smaller than the earth, the moon completed earlier the process of cooling and shrinking and the lunar volcanoes had already ceased to be active. It is calculated that the moon possesses a lighter specific weight than the earth. It is assumed that the moon was produced from the superficial layers of the Earth's body, which are rich in light silicon, whereas the core of the Earth, the main portion of its body, is made of heavy metals, particularly iron. But this assumption postulates the origin of the moon as not simultaneous with the origin of the Earth. The Earth being formed out of a mass ejected from the sun had to undergo a process of leveling which placed the heavy metals in the core and the silicon at the periphery before the moon parted from the earth by a new tidal distortion. This would mean two consecutive tidal distortions in a system, the chance of even one is held extremely rare. If the passing of one star near another happens among 100 million stars once in 5 billion years, two occurrences like this for one and the same star seem quite incredible. Therefore, as no better explanation is available, the satellites are supposed to have been torn from the planets by the sun's attraction on their first perihelion passage. When sweeping along on stretched orbits, the planets came close to the sun. The circling of satellites around the planet also confronts existing cosmological theories with difficulties. Laplace built his theory on the origin of the solar system on the assumption that all planets and satellites revolve in the same direction. He wrote that the axial rotation of the Sun and the orbital revolutions and axial rotations of the six planets, the Moon, the satellites, and the rings of Saturn, 
present 43 movements, all in the same direction. One finds by the analysis of the probabilities that there are more than 4,000 billion chances to one that this arrangement is not the result of chance. This probability is considered higher than that of the reality of historical events, with regard to which no one would venture a doubt. He, do, he, do, he, do, he, do. he deduced that a common and primal cause directed the movements of the planets and satellites. Since the time of Laplace, no members of the solar system have been discovered. Now we know that though the majority of the satellites revolve in the same direction as the planets revolve, and the sun rotates, the moons of Uranus revolve in a plane almost perpendicular to the orbital plane of their planet, and three of the eleven moons of Jupiter, one of the nine moons of Saturn, and one moon of Neptune revolve retrogradely. These facts contradict the main argument of the Laplace theory. A rotating nebula could not produce satellites revolving in two directions. The Tidal Theory In the tidal theory, the direction of the planets, movement, depend on the star that passed. It passed in a plane of which the planets now revolve, and in a direction which determined their circling from west to east. But why should the satellites of Uranus revolve perpendicularly to that plane in some moons of Jupiter and Saturn in reverse directions? This, the tidal theory, fails to explain. Birkeland Currents According to all existing theories, the angular velocity of the revolution of a satellite must be slower than the velocity of rotation of its parent. But the inner satellite of Mars revolves more rapidly than Mars rotates. Some of the difficulties that confront the nebular and tidal theories also confront another theory that has been proposed in recent years. According to it, the Sun is supposed to have been a member of a double star system. A passing star crushed the companion of the Sun and out of its debris planets were formed. In further development of this hypothesis, it is maintained that the larger planets were built out of the debris, and the smaller ones, the so-called terrestrial planets, were formed from the larger ones by a process of cleavage. The birth of smaller, solid planets out of the larger, gaseous ones is conjectured in order to explain the difference and the relation of weight to the volume in the larger and smaller planets. But this theory is unable to explain the difference in the specific weights of the smaller planets and their satellites. By a process of cleavage, the moon was born of the Earth. But since the specific weight of the moon is greater than that of the larger planets and smaller than that of the Earth, it would seem to be more in accord with the theory that the Earth was born of the Moon, despite its smallness. This confuses the argument. The origin of the planets and their satellites remains unsolved. The theories not only contradict one another, but each of them bears within itself its own contradictions. If the Sun had been unattended by planets, its origin and evolution would have presented no difficulties. The Origin of the Comets The nebular and tidal theories endeavor to explain the origin of the solar system, but do not include the comets in their schemes. Comets are more numerous than planets. More than 60 comets are known to belong definitely to the solar system. These are the comets of short periods less than 80 years. They revolve in stretched ellipses, and all but one do not go beyond the line marked by the orbit of Neptune. It is estimated that besides the comets of short periods, several hundred thousand comets visit the solar system. However, it is not known for certain that they return periodically. They are seen presently at an approximate rate of 500 in a century, and are said to have an average period of tens of thousands of years. A few theories of the origin of comets have been proposed, but aside from one attempt to see in them planetesimals that did not receive a side pole, 
sufficiently strong to bring them into circular orbits. No scheme has been developed that explains the origin of the solar system in its entirety, with its planets and comets, yet no cosmic theory can persist which limits itself to the problem of either planets or comets exclusively. One theory sees in the comets errant cosmic bodies arriving from interstellar space. After approaching the sun, they turn away on an open parabolic curve. But if they happen to pass close to the to one of the larger planets, they may be compelled to change their open curves to ellipses and become comets of short period. This is the theory of capture. Comets of long periods, or of no period, are dislodged from their paths to become short period comets. What the origin of the long period comets is remains an unanswered question. The short period comets apparently have some relation to the larger planets. About 50 comets move between the Sun and the orbit of Jupiter. Their periods are under 9 years. Four comets reach the orbit of Saturn. Two comets revolve inside the circle described by Uranus. And nine comets, with an average period of 71 years, move within the orbit of Neptune. These comprise the system of the short period comets as it is known at present. To the last group belongs Halley's Comet, which, among the comets of short periods, has the longest period of revolution, about 76 years. Then, there is a great gap after which there are comets that require thousands of years before they return to the Sun, if they return at all. The distribution of the short period comets suggested the idea that they were captured by the large planets. This theory as for its support, the direct observation that comets are disturbed on their path by planets. Another theory of comets supposes their origin to have been in the sun, but in a manner unlike that conceived of in the tidal theory of the origin of planets. Mighty whirls on the surface of the sun sweep ignited gases into great perturbances. These are observed daily. Matter is driven off from the sun and returns to the sun. It is calculated that if the velocity of the ejection were to exceed 384 miles per second, the speed of motion in a parabola, the matter, would not return to the sun, but would become a long-range comet. Then the path of the ejected mass might become perturbed as a result of its passage near one of the larger planets, and the comet would become one of a short period. The birth of a comet in this manner has never been observed, and the probability that matter in explosion may reach a speed of 384 miles per second is highly questionable. It was therefore supposed, alternatively, that millions of years ago, when the activity of their gaseous masses was more dynamic. The large plants expelled comets from their bodies. The speed required for the ejected mass to overcome the gravitational pull of the ejecting body is less in the case of the planets than in the case of the Sun, owing to their being smaller. Gravitational pull, it is calculated that a mass hurled from Jupiter at a speed of about 38 miles per second, or at only a little more than a third of this velocity in the case of Neptune, would become expelled. This variant of the theory neglects the question of the origin of the long period comets. However, explanation was offered according to which the large planets throw the comets that pass close to them from their short orbits into elongated ones or even expel them entirely from the solar system. When passing close to the sun, comets emit tails. It is assumed that the material of the tail does not return to the comet's head, but is dispersed in space. Consequently, the comets as luminous bodies must have a limited life. If Halley's Comet, or Halley's Comet, whichever you prefer, has pursued 
its present orbit since Precambrian times, it must have grown and lost eight million tails. Well, that's a long time. Which seems improbable. If comets are wasted, their number in the solar system must permanently diminish, and no comet of short period could have preserved its tail since geological times. But as there are many luminous comets of short period, they must have been produced or acquired at some time when other members of the system, the planets and the satellites, were already in their places. A theory has been offered that once the solar system moved through a nebula and obtained its comets there, but that's just a surmise that could never be proven or disproven. Did the sun emit planets by shrinkage or by tide or in comets by explosion? Did the comets come from interstellar space? And were they captured into the solar system by larger planets? Did the larger planets produce the smaller planets by cleavage? Or did they expel the short period comets from their bodies? It is admitted that we cannot know the truth about the origin of the planetary and cometary systems billions of years ago. The problem of the origin and development of the solar system suffers from the label speculative. It is frequently said that as we were not there when the system was formed, we cannot legitimately arrive at any idea of how it was formed. The most we can do, it is believed, is to investigate one planet, the one under our feet, in order to learn its past, and then by the deductive method to apply results to other members of the solar system. End of chapter. I think that the comets, many of them could have been caused by the dynamic electric situation that existed when the planets were closer together. That's just what I think. Thanks for listening.